Would you please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel? Alleluia! You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Alleluia! The Holy Gospel is according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he sent him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, o Christ. Right? Sometimes they cry to come up, but they've never cried to leave that night. <laughs> well, grace and mercy and peace to all of you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My text today is the parable of the Good Samaritan that was read from Luke chapter 10. Now, how many of you have heard of this parable before of the Good Samaritan? Let me see a show of hands. Uh, as I suspected, almost everybody. Because this is one of the best known stories in the whole Bible. We learned about this story when we were little kids in Sunday school, didn't we? We all know the story of the Good Samaritan. So when you hear that Pastor Tim's going to preach on that, it's like, okay, put the snooze button on. I've heard this before, right? Well, I'm going to share something with you about it that you may have never heard before. Usually you have to be a little wary when the pastor says, oh, I'm going to tell you something about this verse that no one's ever heard before. You're like, oh, if it's right there in the text, how come no one else has ever heard it? But every once in a while, there are things that, that cause us to see a text in a certain way, and we don't always see things that may be there that weren't as obvious to us. I think by the, by the time I get to the end of my sermon, you'll probably agree with me. So here's the lawyer, expert in the law, who asked Jesus this question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, is that a good question? Well, in terms of its importance, yes, it really is an important question. That's huge, right? What would you ask Jesus if you could see? Would you ask him about global warming? You know, in a million years from now, there won't be any climate. There won't be any globe. None of that will make any difference. What would you ask him about something in your life? God, I've always wanted to ask you, why was I born with six toes on my head foot? All the kids make fun of me. What, a million years from now, what difference is that going to make? A million years from now, you will either be in full bliss and joy in the presence of God for whom you were made, or you will be suffering an eternal torment, enduring the life that you made for yourself for all eternity. So it's an important question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But in terms of how he frames the question, not so much. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now if you're a good Lutheran, 
your little antenna is already going up, right? You have something suspicious in that question. Why? Because he's asking what he must do to get eternal life. And we all know already, you don't do anything to get eternal life. It's a gift. And so Jesus answers, what shall you do? Well, he says, well, what does the law say? What's in God's word? What's in the scriptures? And the man answers correctly. In fact, he gives two laws right out of the Bible, and all of the other laws in the whole Bible are all really summed up by these two laws. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That comes out of the, right out of the book of Deuteronomy. And if you think about the Ten Commandments, the first table of the law, it's all summed up in that, isn't it? It's about our vertical axis between us and God. What must our relationship be with God? And the second law is love your neighbor as yourself. It's kind of the Bible's take on what we often call the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But it comes right out of the book of Exodus. And everything in the second table of the law, all this, the, the, the last seven commandments, are all summed up in this. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to dishonor them, you're not going to kill them, you're not going to steal from them or commit adultery on them or bear false witness about them, right? And it's talking about our horizontal access. So if you do all those things, you'll have eternal life. There's one big problem. Nobody does those things. None of us do. None of us deserve to inherit eternal life. What do we deserve? We deserve wrath and condemnation. And but for the sake that Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins, that he suffered God's wrath and condemnation in our place, that the joy and bliss of eternal life become ours as a free gift through what Jesus did for us, without that there would be no eternal life. So the first step toward understanding that eternal life is a gift is to first understand that we don't deserve it. For it to be a gift, it's not something that we have earned. And I think if we were all honest with ourselves, we would know that. But the truth is we're not always honest, are we? We have this tendency in ourselves, all of us do, I think, to believe that we're really better people in the sight of God than we really are. And so this lawyer wants to justify himself in front of Jesus. And so he asks, okay, who, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The rest is history, right? The story often becomes a story about our personal ethics. Whom should we help as we go through life? Why? Whoever needs our help, even people we wouldn't ordinarily like to help, right? We should be like the Good Samaritan. We should go out of our way and try to help people in need as we go through life, right? Well, yes, that is presupposed by the text. But there's something much larger going on here, brothers and sisters. Let me show you three things that I think will help you see this text in a very fresh way. First of all, the question that the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? Sounds like he's a weasel, doesn't he? Sounds just like a lawyer, right? <laughs> he's trying to find a loophole. But it's not as weaselly a question as we might suppose. Did you hear Erna read the Old Testament text from Leviticus? Did you catch the last verse of that where this love your neighbor as yourself appears. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who are the neighbors in that context? Why, if you're a Jew, fellow Jews, it's your own people. What should their attitude be toward non-Jews? Well, those of you that come to the adult Sunday school class and went to my class on judges, I saw, I saw, I saw a couple smiles because I always got to work in my commercial, right, to get people to come to Sunday school class. So if you went to the judges class, one of the things you know is that according to the law of Moses, how should the Jews treat people who were not Jews? Well, let's say you were a Canaanite. How should the Jews treat the Canaanites? They're supposed to kill them. They're supposed to execute them. 
What about the cities the Jews would run across in the Promised Land that were not inhabited by one of the seven people groups that they were supposed to execute? Then what were you supposed to do if you were Jewish? Well, they were supposed to turn, make them do forced labor. Slavery. You know, I hear these things now in our current climate in America about how America's founding was illegitimate because we practiced slavery at the founding. And I addressed that in my sermon last week, how this idea of all men are created equal, that, that comes from Christianity. Once that was embedded in our founding documents, slavery's time was, was, uh, was going to come to an end. It was Christians who fought against slavery. William Wilberforce, who to, the, to his own health detriment, uh, had slavery abolished from the United, from the British Empire. It was Christians who were the prime movers for abolition in the United States in the early times of our country. That's love I thought I'd love to teach about slavery. But one of the things we've got to realize is that to put the Old Testament into this larger picture of the scripture, how were the Jews supposed to treat their neighbors who were not Jews? They were supposed to make them slaves. Or kill him? Who is my neighbor? That's an important question. Second, who were then the Samaritans? In this parable, Jesus tells the story of the Samaritan. And the, the title of the parable has gone down in history, and it's entered even into our English language in the phrase, the good Samaritan. It doesn't say that anywhere here, but how many times have you heard that phrase, the good Samaritan? And now we have the Good Samaritan Lutheran Church. We have Good Samaritan Hospital. We have Good Samaritan Ministries to the Poor. We have a Good Samaritan Homeless Shelter. So what do you know about the Samaritans? Uh, well, they were good. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is the exact opposite. In the minds of the Jews, there were no good Samaritans. They didn't even have Samaritans. You know what they had? They had Samaritans. <laughs> they were the most despised people out there for the Jews. Why? Well, for one thing, because the Samaritans were related to the Jews, if you go back in their, their genealogical timeline. So they should have known better. In the history of Israel, when the two southern tribes... And, and were split off from the ten northern tribes. It was the ten northern tribes that were the ancestors of the Samaritans. And the two southern tribes, they were faithful to God some of the time, once in a while. The ten northern tribes that became the Samaritans, they were never faithful to God. They were caught up in idolatry. They were pure rebels against the God, all against God all the way. And after the northern tribe had been captured and taken away for the Assyrian exile, those that came back intermarried with the local residents. So they had impure bloodlines. They intermarried with non-Jews. Now, does God care about ethnic or racial intermarriage? Not today. Not in the least. You know what he does care about? Spiritual intermarriage, right? Don't be unequally yoked. That means if you're a Christian, don't marry someone who is not a Christian. But in the Old Testament, to illustrate that point, from the laws of Moses and the Pentateuch all the way up to Nehemiah, the principle was don't marry outside your race. Don't marry non-Jews. Well, the Samaritans had done that. And third, the Samaritans were self-righteous about these religious things in which they were completely wrong. You remember the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, and she's talking to him about how you Jews worship at Jerusalem, and we Samaritans worship here in this mountain, Mount, Ger Mount Gerizim, and which is right. Remember what Jesus said to her? The Jews worship what we know. You can worship what you don't know. In other words, you guys are completely the Jews had accepted the books of the Bible from the writings and the prophets and the, the books of history that became part of the Old Testament. But the Samaritans said, oh no, we're only going to have the books of Moses. And so the, the Samaritans were very self-righteous about things where they were completely wrong. So in Jesus' parable, the very worst of the worst 
would be Samaritans in the minds of those that, to whom he's giving this parable. But thirdly, and most of all, think about this. If Jesus was trying to teach in the parable that we should love our neighbor, meaning the person with whom we'd be most inclined naturally not to, then Jesus told the parable all wrong. We are all inclined to love people that are more acceptable to us, right? Take, for example, a beautiful, beautiful woman. Drop dead gorgeous. And you see her standing over there in the corner. Maybe she just hung up the phone or something. And there's a little tear running down her cheek. And you feel this great urge to come over and say, is everything okay? Can I help? I told this in my sermon to the sailors at Great Lakes on Friday. They were all laughing because they know it's true. Oh, for sure it's true. We would all help that girl. Ah, but would you help somebody? Their face is like this. And their hair is like that. And their clothes are like this. And they don't smell very good. When I was a chaplain, you know, people used to come in to see me for counseling. And this, we'd be in this little tiny office. There's my chair, and there's the chair where the person sits. Especially people who are um, depressed in depression, a lot of times uh, they stop taking care of themselves. So sometimes they would come in and sit across from me, and they smell terrible. And part of me said, I want to be a loving shepherd and care for this person's need. But the whole hour I was talking to them, the other part of me was saying, I can't wait till they get out of here so I can fumigate my office. <laughs> we all naturally love the people that are desirable to us or that we like. So if Jesus is trying to tell us that what we should do is love people like the Samaritans, people that we don't like, then he told the story the wrong way, didn't he? It should be the Samaritan that gets robbed and the Jew who is the Jew's neighbor, why he should take care of this terrible, horrible Samaritan, but that's not it. It's the Jew that gets robbed. And it's the despised Samaritan that takes care of him. The parable is backwards because it's not primarily, it's not mostly about our personal ethics and how we live. Jesus asked him the question, who proved to be the neighbor? Who's the person that turns out in the end to be living according to the, the covenant stipulations. Who's doing what God said in the law should be done, and thereby giving evidence that they belong to God? Who is the person that seems to be one of God's people, when of course we all know that they're not God's people? It's the Samaritan. You see, this is a story that shows us how with the coming of Jesus, everything is different. God's law, his covenant, his relationships to people, his free gift at one time that was to the Jews, but now it is extended to all, even those who were formerly despised. I wish I could give you all the evidence here, but one of the main thrusts in Luke's gospel is that Luke is the only one in the gospel that tells us certain stories he, he, he's always trying to show us how God is reaching now to the outsiders and the marginalized. For example, this story, the Good Samaritan, only in Luke. Um, the story of the ten lepers, and only one returns to give thanks, and he was a Samaritan, only in Luke. The Sidonian woman, the woman with the flow of blood, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, God in Luke's gospel again and again is showing us that it's the people that we thought were on the outsides that now in Christ are welcomed by God. And that includes us. So where are you in this story? If you read this parable primarily as an ethics lesson, you will tend to see yourself as a good Samaritan. You'll think, yes, I'm trying to be a good Samaritan. Yes, I, I put money in the Salvation Army can at Christmas time. Yes, I helped that lady who had a flat tire on the side of the road. Yes, I donate my used clothing every year to the Good Samaritan Clothing Drive. Well, I'm not perfect, but I'm getting better and better all the time. I am a Good Samaritan. <laughs> but if you see this story as alluding to the fact that now the kingdom of God has been ushered in, 
you begin to see yourself as, oh, I am a Samaritan. And Christ has made me his own. You're not acceptable to God because of the things you do, because you're a good Samaritan. You are acceptable to God, and you do those good things because God has made you his own. This week I'm driving down the road, and in front of me is a motorcycle, and in front of the motorcycle is a truck. And I can see the motorcycle, he's driving almost on the yellow line, looking around the truck. And I knew it was going to happen, and sure enough, and he darts out, and he swerves in front of that truck, and by that time I was able to see what's going on. And here there were cars in the oncoming lane. I mean, this guy barely made it. I'm thinking the truck driver probably had a heart attack. And if not the truck driver, the car in the oncoming lane must have really had a heart attack to see this motorcycle shooting right at him. Anytime you pass, it is perilous. It is a dangerous thing. Watch out. The priest passed by. The Levite passed by. Don't pass by this story and think of it only as something to help you be a better person. Grab a hold of yourself today and remember that there is no good thing in you. There's nothing by which you deserve eternal life and should inherit it. But it is God in Christ who has brought you in. Amen. Would you please rise now and join me in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under much Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy 